seek to be a help up there. And um, we just pray for their safety. That we pray for the van issues they're having and that they'll be able to drive safely all the way home. And uh, these kind of things can be a headache, but sometimes you, well, every time we see how you work things out. And so we just pray you give them patience and help them to uh, use wisdom and, and all these uh, things can, and a lot of times we just throw up our hands in the air and pray, Lord, come quickly. But it's not just because of uh, personal or uh, financial issues or things like that, but the world and the condition it's in, uh, what's going on in our world and in our country and around the world and what's going on with uh, Israel and uh, what's going on with the Islamic refugee problem and, and so much going on that's so ugly with the the way children are abused and abducted and the, the sex slave trade that's going on around the world and just so much it makes us long for home and we do pray you come quickly and uh, we see folks like Otis going through what he is with cancer and we do pray for his blood count uh, to come up and we pray that while he may not want to be around other people right now, maybe this will be a time where he'll turn to you and draw closer to you. And uh, we know that Otis clearly has heard and knows Jesus died for his sins, was buried and rose again. And he has made a profession. And so we pray that now will be a time where he'll draw near and we all have uh, relatives and friends who are going through hard times. Some, it's, it is health. We pray for each one to draw near to the Lord, draw near to you and to spend time talking to you, reading or listening to your word, and even singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Even if they don't sing them out loud, they can sing in their heart. And we pray for the same thing, uh, for Velma, who I know uh, is uh, troubled by uh, watching what Otis is going through and also making these decisions about downsizing and moving. We pray for your comfort for her. We pray the same for Jenny's mom, Marilyn, and the pain and suffering that she has with arthritis and other things. We're thankful that uh, we know Velma and Marilyn are saved and they can draw near to you we know they do and uh, we pray for Mark his need for a truck and uh, that you'll help him find something that is good transportation uh, we pray for Pastor Cujo as he battles brain cancer and uh, we just lift him up to you Lord it's just a rough terrible thing took my uncle recently and it's taken others that we know and we just pray for him very thankful that he's saved uh, we pray for Dre and his upcoming work training at uh, Ohio State and we just pray you be with him and and uh, use him there Lord we pray for Kate Decker's dad again who's going through this terrible thing with cancer and had uh, this surgery and some complications with it and Lord we place him in your hands we're thankful that you've been there and helped him through so far, thus far. We pray for Diana as Tracy tries to help her uh, find a assisted or senior living home. And there's an opportunity down the street from Tracy, so we just pray that uh, you will provide their Lord if it's good for her. And uh, we pray for Mark's buddy Tom, who's now lost his son in a car accident after losing his wife. And it's just a horrible thing. And uh, But we do know Tom can turn to you, be comforted, encouraged in the Lord, and helped along his way. We pray he'll do that. We know you are there. And, uh, so we lift up uh, the unspoken request. Janie mentioned she has three, and um, we're thankful for the answered prayers, including 
Sean mentioning that Joyce had an unspoken that has now been answered, and we thank you for that. We pray for uh, Janie's uh, manager there, Monique, with this uh, cyst on her ovaries. Lord, <coughs> you give the doctor uh, the wisdom or the team probably of doctors and nurse practitioners and everybody who's working with her. And uh, we just also pray that if she's not saved, Lord, that this would be a time when she turns to Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together tonight. We're thankful for the family of God. We're thankful for all the churches meeting tonight who have come together to study the Bible and to pray. Those churches that preach and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some churches have their midweek service on Thursday. Some don't have a midweek, but they're still faithfully preaching the gospel and teaching the Bible on Sundays. Lord, we're so thankful for each and every uh, local church family because they're all our family. And we look forward to meeting many of them that we will not meet this side of heaven. We look forward to meeting all the saints that have gone on before us when the dead in Christ rise and then we follow them up if you return soon. And Lord, we're just so thankful because none of us, not one of us deserves salvation. All of us saved by grace and we just will give you all the glory. We love you, Lord, and pray that uh, you're pleased with us tonight with our hearts, with our attitudes, and also with our study as we open your book and with the help of your Holy Spirit, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Real quick, we're going to have a work day Saturday. And uh, we'd like to have a few people show up and help us. I'll be here about 9. If I'm a few minutes late, you know, don't leave. I'll be here. Of course, unless I've been in an accident, been, you know, that's something else. But Or the rapture takes place and you were left behind, then you can have it. But uh, <laughs> birthday cake the next day, June 10th. We got uh, a couple of birthdays. And we'll be uh, having uh, cake after Bible study. Then the following week is Father's Day. And, um, you know... Maybe I should let you people call me Father. That way, Father's Day, man, I'd get all kinds of good gifts, right? But I can't because the Bible says not to call any man Father, except for, you know, you can call your bio, bio dad and father. But... I, I... <laughs> yeah. I can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, then uh, we're going to have a movie night. That's a Friday night, June 22nd, 7 p.m., and uh, that's the TBA. We'll tell you what we're going to watch. It'll be a movie, not a documentary. And then the 30th band practice, which most of the band is in Canada right now. <laughs> and then uh, just, it'll be here before you know it. Our next Feast of Charity. Because it's supposed to be hot. So we're going to have cold cuts and salads. Church will have a big pl platter of meat with bread. You can make sandwiches. And then uh, on the 4th of July, which is a Wednesday, we're going to grill out. We're going to get the old tank out here. and um, Stephen's supposed to be here to do that because I can't do it. And we're going to have hot dogs. Or if you want you, any meat you bring, we'll throw it on there. So bring, bring, I mean, we'll have hot, plenty of hot dogs for everybody. But if you want to eat something else and, or, or, or bring your tofu. <laughs> Fireworks, yeah. <laughs> Is it legal to eat that yet? Nah, no illegal meats. Hey, Dorian. Oh, thumbs up. All right. Now, for some reason, uh, my uh, computer, my computer got a uh, Windows update. If you have Windows, you better beware. It just totally screwed up my computer. Thankfully, the slideshow still works, but on, my uh, audio only works about half the time. 
Yeah. But anyway, that's a reminder. Turn off your uh, what? Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Mike yeah. just updated. And you know, Jenny's sister had lost about three days. I found, out, I found out that if you have some some kind of SS something inside, that's when it messes up. If you don't have that, it doesn't. Microsoft knows about it. So are you, are you talking about the Centaur? Are you talking about this? Yeah, yeah, something. I don't really know a lot about it, but it's a very no, I don't know anything about it. Either. All right, that's not your current events update. This is. Uh, we always talk about in house discussions between Christians. Well, this is an outhouse discussion. <laughs> gay Pride. June is Gay Pride Month. Proud to be an abomination. That's what they're proud of. When you walk up and down the street, Gay Pride, you're proud. Of the fact that you're an abomination, an unrepentant, wicked person. Um, had one of them tell me this week on online that we were oppressing them, and I said, "Your sin oppresses you. Uh, we're, we're calling on you to repent and be saved, and you can be set free." Um, but uh, yes. <laughs> There's your president that a bunch of brain-dead Christians don't have a sense enough to be thankful for. First president in years, two years in a row, he's Hallelujah. missed the LGBTQ month. Hallelujah. Your last president lit the White House up with the fag flag. Yeah. And you got a president now who just ignores the, go the, the nonsense. Thank God for Donald Trump. You know what? I don't care who gets mad at me. I don't care who out there I get email and stuff. You know what? You can take a flying leap if you don't like it. I thank God for this president. And if he turns on us next week, I'll be up here denouncing it. <laughs> but up to this point, anybody, any of your relatives, I don't care if it's your own mother, if she ain't thankful for this man, she's stupid. Christians have got to wake up. You find you got a little bit of reprieve. You better be thankful for it. That's Israel. They were not thankful for their kings like Josiah, Hezekiah. They weren't. They were thankless boobs. And as soon as Hezekiah died or Josiah died, they all showed their true colors. That's what America is right now. But I thank God for that man. I don't care if he's even doing it for the wrong reason. I still thank God for him. All right, that's it. Let's get into the Bible study. Daniel 10, 1 through 21. We're going to do the whole chapter. The reason we're going to go through the whole chapter is, uh, you know, we, we went line by line from Daniel 9, 24, 27. I don't know how many studies. I didn't count them. I think we did about seven or eight. But we go as fast as we need to go and as slow as we need to go. So it kind of equals out. Sometimes we'll cover three words and sometimes three verses and sometimes a whole chapter. But uh, we're going to cover Daniel's last vision in the last three chapters of Daniel, 10, 11, 12. And so it begins here in Daniel chapter 10, uh, covering verses 1 through 21. And I just thought I'd give something. I just he, We'll see in this text that he was standing on the Tigris and he's looking out and... Uh, uh, it, I don't. It doesn't really indicate what time of day, but I just picture him out there at sunset, and this like this beautiful sunset that we got a picture of. This is actually out. This this is taken in my backyard. Mm -hmm. That picture right there, yeah. the clouds, and I just picture him on the Tigris outside of Babylon. Hittikel is a biblical word for it. And uh, there's Dan. Somebody tell him he's got pizza waiting on him. But uh, the the uh, setting, the picture of Daniel, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through it. But I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we begin to study the picture. And I only want to read the first 10 verses and then we'll start going through it. And then I'll have you read the others with me as we go through. But read the even. I'll read the odd. You join in the even. Beginning of verse 1, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, and the, but the time appointed was long, 
And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in collar to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Now the remainder of Daniel 10, 11, 12, that's three chapters remaining. It's a cohesive unit that is divided into three major parts. Now, you have 21 verses in chapter 10, and chapter 11 is a, a long 45 verses, and then chapter 12 is a short 13 verses. And I've heard some men complain, say, well, I think they should have just left that as one chapter. And I said, no, it actually, it was very well done. It's broken up into three uh, uh, parts by chapter, and it really works out very nicely. It's amazing how you, when you stop being a critic and you just look at the Bible, take it as it is, you find that God's done an incredible thing. And I'm not talking about the originals. I'm talking about what he's produced in English in our King James Bible and the chapters and the verses Everything about it. I love it. <laughs> I wouldn't change a thing about it. I think there's some, something wrong with a man when he stands up there and says, well, I think the King James would be better if it was this or that. I'm like, just shut up. <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody's got to sound like they're smarter than everybody else and all that. No, this book is much smarter than me. This book is much superior to me or anyone else I've ever known. And every, I'm sure it's anyone who ever lived. Amen. It's all about the book. Verse 1 started out by saying, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. And by this time, Daniel was retired from public service, and he's around 90 years of age. Now, I want to just tell you ahead of time, some of these timelines are very difficult to, to track. And uh, don't get lost in that, uh, trying to figure out every jot and tittle of the timeline, because... Uh, what you need is a general understanding. You're talking about a 90-year-old man who is basically retired. You remember he was the president of Babylon. And the, the king basically let Daniel run things the way Joseph did in Egypt under the Pharaoh. And all these years later now, 90, around 90 years of age, it said that Daniel, and it said whose name was called Belteshazzar. And uh, that was a name given to him and uh, that's kind of what has happened to you and me. Because you have a name right now, and it's really a pagan name. You say, how's that? Well, because I, there are very few people whose names um, aren't, don't, I, my name's Gregory. That's a Greek name. And it has pagan connections. The Gregorian calendar. Although I still have this thing, Tracy is. Uh, <laughs> Gregory, watchman, watchful. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Where's your cape? Yeah, I need a cape. But one of these days, if you're saved, one of these days you're going to get a new name. See? So your name right now, temporary. It's your earthly name. And it's like, you know, Superman had the name Clark Kent, but he was really Superman. Well, your Clark Kent is your name now. 
And one of these days, you're going to be better than Superman. Think about that? I mean, that's serious. You're going to be better than Superman. You won't have any kryptonite. You'll be better than Superman. Why? Because you're going to be like Jesus, and he's better than Superman. Amen. So that's just an important tidbit. And then it goes on to say, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. In other words, this is a prophecy about the far distant future when it says the, appoint, the time appointed was long. Uh, it's, going to, it's, it's in the far distant future to Daniel. It's very close to our day and age, I believe. You see that? Daniel's looking far into the future. He's looking into, I think, just a few years from now. That's pretty exciting. Now Daniel recounts the circumstances at the time he received this final prophetic vision. In verse 2, we see that it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. It's safe to assume that he is mourning the fact that he will not be returning to the Jewish homeland. Kind of like Moses who wasn't able to go into the promised land, Daniel was taken out as a very young man and is not going to go back. Um, and it's also very likely that he's not happy with the fact that if you go back and read in Ezra, that there wasn't a big response to the opportunity to go back. And the rebuilding was not going very well there at first. And so it's likely that that's what he was mourning as well. So Daniel could have returned to Israel with those who had done so three years prior. We can only guess that his age kept him from doing so. He was 90. <laughs> his heart was there. I'm sure he wanted to be there, but he's 90. Here you go. There's the map. Let's say old Daniel decided he's going to walk back to Jerusalem. Well, even people, it, you have to be in really good shape to walk about four miles per hour for eight hours in a day. And if you could do four miles per hour for eight, for eight hours, that's 32 miles. So he'd walk for 23 and a half days. A 90-year-old man, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. Even if he went half that speed, two miles per hour, It'd be 16 miles in an eight-hour day. It would take him 47 days. Now, here's how I expect he would have been walking. And I don't have a cane, but I'll use this thing here. Okay. <laughs> We're going to get to Jerusalem. Okay. 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 <laughs> Time for a break. <laughs> See, sometimes you read the Bible, you gotta get real with it, you know what I mean? He's 90! So I probably get 90 for that. Well, I don't know. I think he wouldn't make it. <laughs> I think he would have been, if he could have lived that long, he would have arrived about the time Jesus was born. <laughs> And that's desert terrain, 750 miles from home. Here, he would walk through this, by the way, that's yesterday's Baghdad current weather report, which is just north of Babylon, 107 degrees, but it's sunny. <laughs> so I don't think most people would make it uh, in that weather, no matter how good shape they're in. So you have a 90-year-old man in 533 B.C. He's not making that trip. Can we say amen? amen? So verse 3 then says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks are fulfilled. So at age 90, he goes three weeks without meat or a bath. And uh, he's not doing it uh, for show. He's doing it because that's how brokenhearted he is. And uh, I love Daniel. And the more every time I read through the book of Daniel, it just makes you love him even more. 
And then you, then I didn't even realize the first few times I read through it that we're talking at this point, this faithful old man who served as a God his whole life, loved the Lord. He wanted to go back home, <laughs> but he was stuck in Babylon. Who's that sound like? Ought to sound like you. You want to go home, but you're stuck in Babylon. <laughs> Verse four says, and in the four and 20th day of the first month. All right, come on now. When was this? First month. Nissan. Nissan. What's that mean? So it's right after Passover. See? But you know there's no indication they observed Passover. As a matter of fact, um, uh, there's after they uh, go back, uh, I think it's a while before they do Passover. But you'll see that in after after Moses died, it seems like they let Passover go until uh, who was it that held the first one after that? I'm, I'm having a lapse of memory, but that there's a homework assignment. Go back and read that. I know when Josiah comes along, there had been a long lapse without Passover. So we have to do some homework on that and get back on it. But Hidekel is the Tigris today, if you look at it on the map. It's more than two hours by car from Babylon. That's how... So. Uh, Daniel has somehow or other, I, I imagine, uh, gotten to the Tigris by some means uh, because it was, even if he had a Ford Mustang back then, it would have taken him two, two hours. Yeah, he thumbed his way there. <laughs> there's, there's your map again today if you want to drive it. The Babylonian governorate, as it's called in Iraq, Tigris is over. The Euphrates is close. But the Hittichel, the Tigris is not. <clears throat> it's a couple hours away. So Daniel's now going to be visited, and some believe that this is none other than the Lord Jesus. You'll see why there. If you look in verse 5 and 6, and you, we've read this a number of times, if you compare it with the descriptions of the glorified Jesus. He lift up mine eyes, he says, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. And then look at verse 6. His body was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning. We talked about that Sunday in our study, that we're going to be like Jesus. And his face is as the appearance of lightning. And his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like a in color to polished brass and the voice of his words like the multi voice of a multitude and we have to compare that to Revelation 1 so go ahead and turn over there Revelation 1 scripture with scripture best commentary on the Bible is the Bible Revelation chapter 1 beginning verse 13 I'll read verse 13 while you're turning there in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, gold like an uphaz. That we just read in Daniel. Verse 14, his head and his hairs are, were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as flame of fire. Read 15 and 16 with me. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two, sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, take a minute sometime and just compare exactly what you read in Daniel to It's not without its difficulties. And we'll see that in verse 12 as we continue. But verse 7 says, And I, Daniel, alone, in Acts 9, when, God, and when Jesus... Now, who was it? Paul. It was Jesus. So you see why there's some correlations here. He was glorified. 
Also oh yeah, that's yeah, that's similar. Yeah, that's right. So then eight and nine says, Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. So before telling us the vision, Daniel tells us the effect it had on him. He was overwhelmed. And that's why I'll repeat it over and over. I don't buy the nonsense when people say, Jesus came in my bedroom last night. And we... That's right. <laughs> so you passed out. You, you totally lost all strength and hit the floor face down, completely passed out. No, we sat there and just talked like we were best friends. <laughs> in the Bible that's not how it happens all of it I'm telling you don't you are you calling me a liar <laughs> yes I am <laughs> and they write books and they sell them and uh, there's this uh, there's these Jewish messianic Jews uh, a guy's a Jews, Jewish rabbi he calls himself and Jesus said not to call any man a rabbi <laughs> but there's these messianic pastors who want to be called rabbi and then they claim Jesus visits them and the, he's always the Kenny Loggins version of Jesus he's never the glorified version and you know what I don't care who they are I don't care how many followers they have on Facebook or whatever if they say things that go against what we know the Bible says then <laughs> on them 10-11 says, and behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he, read verse 11 with me. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. So picture this frail, faithful, wonderful, the Bible says greatly beloved, 90-year-old man trembling in the presence of the Lord. And I think when it says he reached out and touched him, I think it's a very uh, compassionate touch. You know, and I think I see a, a glimpse of that whenever we have a thunderstorm and our little shih tzu begins to shake. Yeah. And Jenny reaches down and don't shake, oh. She just about cries. I know, it's so sad. <laughs> now, Jenny would, I'm not saying, telling you anything about Jenny that she wouldn't admit herself. Jenny is nothing but a sinner saved by grace. Amen. But she has that much compassion on a little dog. Can you imagine the compassion Almighty God has on you mm. and me? What a wonderful God we have. You do realize he doesn't have to do that. He could just say, you know, next time Doug, you know, smashes his finger and says the S word. <laughs> he could. I'm not accusing him of that. I was just joking. I, I'm sure he says much worse. He says, Shih Tzu! <laughs> ah, we just la lost half our live stream audience right there. <laughs> but I just think of how God, there's nothing stopping him from just, you know, I've said this before, but I'm like maybe that big, and he could just go <laughs> right into the lake of fire. Why didn't he do that? Thankfully, he's not only gracious, but he is righteous. And he's promised not to do that to me. Amen. So I know he's not going to do it. If I didn't know I could take his word for it, I'd be a Muslim. Because <laughs> Islam, you have no idea what that Allah is going to do with you. Muhammad himself said he doesn't know for sure he's going to heaven. He well, and he didn't. Amen. But even if Allah were real, 
and Muhammad were his prophet, which he's not. They even admit there's no knowing what Allah is going to do. Why? Because Allah is not really righteous and just. And so if he were the God, he would be a very bad one. But thank God, he's not the God. The God of the Bible manifest in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ is God. He's the Word and He's true to His Word. Verses 12 and 13 says, Then said He unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from... Now here's where we're getting to the difficulties of, of believing this is Jesus. So watch closely. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now here's the problem. Read verse 13 with me. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. See, the uh, difficulty there is kind of obvious. The idea that Jesus had to have Michael's assistance presents a real dilemma. But there are some answers to that dilemma. Um, did you understand what we read before I move on? It says that he had to wait for Michael to come and help him. So that's why, well, that can't be Jesus. He wouldn't need Michael's help. But just put your uh, car in park here for a second and consider God has his reasons for limiting himself. Like I said, he's limited himself. The very first time you sinned, he could have just gone, but he didn't. And we cannot even number the ways that God has limited himself, withheld judgment, and that sort of thing. And then you go back and read sometime, if you haven't lately, Genesis 32, 24 to 32, he wrestled, not rested, he wrestled all night with Jacob. And you don't think he, did he have to wrestle all night? Jacob couldn't, you know, was God couldn't have just gone, you know, hmm. <laughs> at the end, he showed what he could do. He touched the sinew in his thigh. And that's why, to this day, the Jews won't eat that part of an animal. And he limped the rest of his life from that. He went, Boop, and it, <laughs> yeah, and he's limped the rest of his life. He li Jacob limped the rest of his life. Yeah, Dorian? Yeah, but that angel, he, at the end, says, I've wrestled with God. And who is he wrestling with? It was Jesus. Pre-incarnate, they call those Christophanies, where Jesus showed up before he came as a babe. So there you go, and then Jesus doesn't unleash his power until Revelation 19. So you have some dilemmas, but the real answer is, God, his thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. And this is, I'm not telling you you have to accept this or think this way, but this is how I think. God knows everything. I, in His presence, I am just a nincompoop. I have no knowledge compared to God. And just think of how that's true. Like, like I said, you don't have to go around saying that, but it's true about everybody, all of us. None of you, including Stephen Hawking. He is not all that. That was my imitation. <clears throat> he died and went to hell, according to his profession, because he thought he was smarter than God. Carl Sagan. Albert Einstein. Lucifer. Lucifer. The greatest minds who have ever lived. Lucifer's probably right way above any of them. And you just think about that. But how many people do you know? I know people who even compared to me are stupid. And that's saying something. And yet they think they're smarter than God. And they think that they've got it figured out and God's wrong. Their opinion, that's the way it's going to be. That Bible, nah. Just think about the audacity and stupidity of that. So, when I come to this, I'm telling you, I kind of think it is Jesus. 
But I don't think it's something that make. I don't think it requires us to take this strong stand and say, "This is Jesus. If you don't like it, get out." We're going to start our own denomination. <laughs> it's not anything like that. But it's it that interesting to think about? I thought so. Daniel 14, 10, 14, I'm sorry, says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Again, it's all about Israel. It's not about the church. The church is not in the period of time prophesied about, which is the 70th week, which is the time of Antichrist. We call it the Great Tribulation. It's all about Israel. Verses 15 through 17 says, And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> He's just like, uh, well, I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. And every one of these arrogant people who think that they're smarter than God, when they stand before that great white throne, that's what they're going to do. They're all going to hit the ground. They're not going to smart off. I mean, you know, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, all these atheists, loudmouth Bill Maher, all those people, they're obnoxiously arrogant. But when they stand before Jesus Christ, they aren't going to run their mouths. They're going to do exactly this. Verse 16 says, And behold, one, like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. You see, there it is. That's an angel. And every time you see an angel, he's not got these big flapping wings. You know. And it says he's, he's a man. He looks like a man. And I don't think, uh, you know, there are no women. Which is why touched by an angel is so goofy. But it's also why if you just do a search, first of all, if you do a search on angels, I learned this the hard way a few years ago, put your safe search on. You do a search on the internet for angels, you get some really lewd stuff. But then even if you put your safe search on, a lot of the pictures and depictions of angels, even by Christians, they're effeminate, sensual, revealing, weird, <laughs> just weird. It's like, I feel that way about, you know, uh, you, you see the big news this week, big, you know, hard-hitting news story this week. Should have done this in the current events. Which one is it? Miss, Miss America. America is no longer going to have swimsuits. And I know uh, some of you are heartbroken over that. <clears throat> but I, I would, I know, when I, even when I was younger, I, people would watch that stuff, and I'd watch it. And I thought, this is weird. You got all these women up there like a bunch of cattle being herded in. They need to add sound effects like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got all these women in their bikinis like you'd look at a cow and say, oh, look at the rump on that thing. That's going to make a good roast. <laughs> and these almost naked women, and they're out there doing their thing and everything, and you're picking someone to be Miss USA or Miss America, whichever. Miss America. Miss America. Uh, and based on how they look in a bikini? How weird is that? Well, the, to me, though, it's even more weird. Now they're not going to have the bikini thing. What's the purpose? Because you're just going to have a bunch of girls. I, no offense, but most of them are young, and they just haven't really taken the world seriously. And they're going to up there and wax eloquent on politics and on world events and world situations. What do you think? Uh, you know, every one of them. What, what, what do you want to do with your life? I want to work for world peace. <laughs> and how do you want? How do you? How are you going to do that? I want to paint pictures, and I think if I paint pictures of peace, the world will look at the pictures and they'll want peace. <laughs> that's one. I mean, that's what. So anyway, that's kind of the thing going on with angels. Why would you paint an angel and make it look like a chick who is built like Miss, U Miss America in a bikini? A lot of times it looks like they're in a bikini with big wings. 
I mean, and sometimes it's by people who are professing Christians. I expect the world to act like that. That's just weird. Because then, it, and you're like, do you ever read your Bible? You can go from Genesis to Revelation. You'll never find a, an angel that looks like that. But it appeals to people's flesh. That's Victoria's Secret. Yeah, Victoria's Secret. I wouldn't know from experience, but I'll take your word for it. It does. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the beauty contest goes all the way back to Esther, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what was. <laughs> I don't know if she was in a bikini, but it was no, Miss. No, 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 it was no, no, Miss. Yeah. It was Miss Persia, though. It was a Miss Persia contest, and uh, Ahasuerus was like, uh, "So, what do you want to do with your life?" And Queen yeah, Esther yeah. said, uh, "I just don't want all the Jews to be killed." You know. <laughs> I wonder, Fred. I wonder, Fred went crazy on TV. Fred, who? Sandra. Esther. Oh, that did, wrong uh, Esther there, Mark. Talking about the Bible, Esther. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it says, Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the vision my sorrows have turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Verse 17, For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. It's funny, this is like the third time where he's describing how he's just totally overwhelmed by what he's experiencing here. And again, the angel appears as any other son of man. And again, Daniel is dumbfounded. Verses 18 and 19 says, Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man. There's another angel. And again, he's a man. And he strengthened me. Verse 19 said, And, uh, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Second time it's called greatly beloved. Peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. This is interesting. Where angels possess healing powers. And just think about this. This is just food for thought. We're going to be like the angels. Jesus said, we'll be, or John, 1 John 4, uh, or 3, 1 through 3, says we will be as he is, but Jesus said, we will be as the angels. Now you say, well, what, what do you mean by that? I'm just floating this as a fact. If we're going to be as the angels, wouldn't it be interesting if during the millennium, at least some of us have that as a job? The, the, the people on earth living here are going to be just like you and me are now. They're mortal and they're prone to accidents. They could fall. They could, who knows what? Uh, you know, could be uh, gun, you know, guns and they'd shoot and somebody gets accidentally shot or something. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, it, life in the millennium is going to be a lot like it is now, only a lot different. I know that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but it does. Now, wouldn't that be something if some of us have that job or if someone gets hurt, we show up and we do exactly what we just read? They touch him and heal him and strengthen him. That's just uh, something to think about because that's what happened there. In verse 20, read that with me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. Look at that. Are you reading it with me? Read it again. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. We're talking about angelic warfare here. War among the angels, both good and bad. And that's the kind of thing I believe is going on all the time. But we don't see it because... Well, there's all these dimensions and we're stuck in between here. But I believe the angels are out here. So we don't see and hear things, but we will. In our glorified state, we're going to see all the angels and all that they do all day long. <laughs> and then we'll also see 
all the saints who are glorified and all they do all day long. Something. I love, I just love the thought. And think about this. When you think about whether this is Jesus described here, generals fight, but they lead the troops and rarely engage in combat. You know, if you read about General Lee and General um, Grant, and, you know, of course, there's all kinds of others, but those are the two leaders of the, during the war between the states, the Civil War, and you read the battles fought by Grant, the battles fought by Lee, they didn't actually get down and, you know, fight. They were the generals. And so that could be the use of language here about Jesus. Is reason Jesus uh, on, a, on a much more grand divine scale, but the reason why Jesus waited for Michael to come in and do the work is because Jesus, he's far greater than any general. And so he goes, and when there's battles, the angels come in and do the fighting. That's something to think about, isn't it? <laughs> so verse 21, last verse, and we'll, be, we'll take a few questions. We want to break it down in two parts. It says, but I will show thee that that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. Now look at, look hard at that. He, this is uh, the angelic messenger. But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. He's talking about the Bible as though it's already written, but on earth it's not. What he shows Daniel wasn't in the Bible yet. But he says it's noted in the Scripture of truth. How is that? Psalm 119.89 Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Think of that. He is showing Daniel what's already in the word in heaven. But it's not on earth until after this. And it's actually not readily available until after the uh, apostles... And he says, it is noted in the Scripture of truth. That's an amazing phrase in that verse. And then the verse ends, and the chapter ends, and verse 21 says, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, how's he, how's he say it? Michael what? Your, your prince. Your prince. Not Daniel per se. It's the Jews. Michael is the prince of of Israel. Think of that. Now, Michael's mentioned by Jude. What's he doing in, the, in Jude? He's getting the body of Moses, a Jew. The founder of the Mosaic uh, nation. And he is getting his body from Satan. And it's, you know, instead of him saying, even Michael the archangel, instead of him saying, I bind you in the name of the Lord. And I, you know, he says, the Lord rebuke you. And he takes the body of Moses. And here, it's all about Israel. He's mentioned here. He's only mentioned one other time in Scripture, and that's in Revelation 12. How do you remember what was, what was in Revelation 12? You remember that? Remember the woman with the stars? Which represented who? Israel. Revelation 12 is about Israel being rescued in Petra. That's Michael. Michael's going to be the ground troop. <laughs> the general is Jesus. But Michael's going to lead the charge for Israel. And uh, that's an amazing... Amazing thing. Amen. All right. Doreen, you got a question? Yeah, I'm just now starting to... Yeah, speak loud. I'm just now starting to like get into reading the Bible. And I'm in Exodus now, so I haven't gotten to the point where 
So uh, is Michael, he's a good angel? Like, he's yeah. a good angel? Yeah, Michael is the angel, as we said, the prince of Israel. Gabriel is the only other a, uh, angel named in the Bible. Both Michael and Gabriel are good angels. And then the other angel, he is, well, they'll say the other angel, but Satan was Lucifer. And he wasn't an angel exactly. He was a cherub. So it's a, there's a difference there. But. And you said he said Moses died? Well, yeah. When Moses died, I, here's my theory about that, is the reason why... Um, Satan wanted Moses' body was because uh, he knew that if he could get that body and bury it and turn it into some kind of shrine, you would have had idolatry. <coughs> and the proof of that is, for example, the brazen serpent. They kept that and turned that into an idol. And Hezekiah later busted it into dust because people were offering incense to it. And so that's why I believe God sent Michael to secure the body of Moses. That's one reason. Another reason is because God wasn't done with Moses and Moses shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah who went up in a chariot and Moses needed his body. <laughs> and then I believe that the two witnesses in Revelation are Moses and Elijah. And they'll have their heads cut off and then they'll get, uh, they'll put their heads back on and rip, be raptured and all kinds of wild stuff. Do you, do you yeah. use the mic? Uh, we got to get an extension on it since we moved it. But I'm going to repeat some of your questions if you have any so we can uh, have a record of it. Anybody else? Kim? Do you think people have real visions today? And if so, is it very often? Like, have you ever heard of... Um, the late David Wilkerson, he had a book out, I think, in the 70s called The Vision, that he felt yeah. like he gave him a vision. There's, A, I do believe that God can give people visions and dreams today. I think it's ludicrous to put him in a box and say he can't do that. And I have to say that I had, on more than one occasion, dreams that gave me a heads up and things turned out the way God warned me in the dream but it was for me. That's why I don't put stock in people like the David Wilkerson's who put out books. Because um, the, I believe that uh, scripture bears out that like when an angel comes to you, when an angel came to Mary to tell her about Jesus being born, they didn't go around telling her by that. It got in the Bible. But the message from that angel was for Mary and Joseph. And then of course, he had a message for Zacharias and Elizabeth. But they didn't go around trumpeting it. It ended up in the Bible, and after the fact, we've read about it. So it goes both ways. If God wants to talk to you um, through His Spirit, almost always it'll be through His Word. But I, can, I will not say He doesn't give people visions and dreams, but if what you have in a vision or dream goes against this book, then you know it didn't come from God. There's where a lot of these charismatics who put out these books and you read them, you're like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't weigh with Scripture. So, you know, they either made it up or they could have been given a delusion, a, a, a deceptive vision by a false spirit. I can't judge that. But um, anybody writes a book about a vision. One of the people I first heard teach this when I was first saved was John Hagee. And of all people... He said he had a woman come down in church and they were having, you know, their time of prophecy and all this stuff. Woman said, I have a message from the Lord for you, Pastor. And he said, Well, praise the Lord. Tell him where I live, and if he wants to talk to me, I'll meet him there. <laughs> and he cut her off. Why? Because that woman isn't God's messenger. If God wants to talk to John Hagee in a vision or dream, then he'll talk to John Hagee. Now, I'm not endorsing Hagee. I mean, he's got plenty of issues. He's pro-Israel. I'll give him credit for that. But I don't endorse his ministry. But that was true. Credit where it's due. And I heard that as a very young Christian. That was very helpful to me. Um, I had a woman come up to me in church. I've told this before. Some of you might have heard it. She said, you're the preacher, aren't you? I said, 
Yeah, I am. She said, I knew. Because when you walked in the door, there was a glow about you. And I said, well, could be the sun off my head, you know. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't let that stuff get to me. I, I, I don't know. I'm, sometimes people do that stuff, and it's just flattery. And the Bible has something to say about flattery. All negative. Yeah. yeah. She looked it up, and we ran the references. Not once is flattery given a positive light. So, uh, Dorian? Doug. Or Doug? Which? I just had a comment to say that a lot of people uh, want to get out of situations. And uh, Daniel was the kind that stayed his course. Yes. And he didn't pray for just get me out of here. Yeah. If you're my God, you get me out of my situation, and then I'll trust you. You never yeah. get out of here. Yeah. He trusted God and throughout the course. Amen. That's what we need to do. Yeah. That's why I, I mentioned him at 90 years of age, yeah. and you're talking about a faithful man. Yeah. Faithful. <laughs> he was human, and I'm sure he had his moments, but he was faithful, and he trusted the Lord. Great example. Anybody else? Jenny. Do you think that it could be Jesus in the first part of the chapter and then an angel starting at like verse 10? Because there's like a paragraph change. Like, is it, you think that's possible? Well, there's more than one there. Yeah, but do you know what I mean? I, so You'd have to, you know, you could do a little bit of uh, uh, charting and show where it's Jesus or one of the others, but. For example, there's two places where there's two different angels that aren't the first one. Right, so it's not right, Jesus there. Right, so that's, yeah, I never looked at yeah. that close. Up. It says, uh, then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man um, in verse 18. And then before that, verse 16. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of man touched my lips. Those are two different in addition to what we had seen earlier. Yeah, like in verse 10. Yeah. Well, you're looking at the little paragraph mark. I kind of, yeah. I don't always uh, put a lot of. No, uh, I know, I know. It's just it says, "And behold, an hand touched me." Yeah. Say, it True. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, did you? Uh, so on the Ark of the Covenant is are those cherubs? Yes. On top? Yeah. So it's the same. So Six wings. Lucifer. Yeah. So Lucifer has. He's not on there. I know. <laughs> That's what Lucifer was, though. He was yeah, a chariot. Yeah. <laughs> there would have been three then. Well, now that it does, what, the way it indicates is that uh, Lucifer had his own throne and um, then decided he would, that wasn't good enough. He wanted God's throne. But um, he was a cherub, but it doesn't say he sat at the mercy seat. But Ezekiel 28... And Isaiah 14 is where we get all of our information about Lucifer. There, on the ark, I'm sorry, there, on the ark there are two chariots. Yes. And then, is that, I'm sorry, so are they, are they, you said those are six wings? Yes, they have wings over their eyes, wings here, and wings over their feet. And that's in Isaiah chapter uh, 6 where it talks about and, and his train filled the temple. Yeah, yeah, that's another reference about the chariot. Yeah. You do a word search on cherub and seraphim are the two very interesting reading there for your Bible study. The seraphim No, that's the uh, creature in Ezekiel that isn't really given a name. Those are wild. Yeah, those are wild. Those are the ones that the History Channel tell you are UFOs. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's stand. And let's close with a song. Oh, I just dropped the microphone. Didn't break it. <clears throat> I'm going to try to start this in the right key here. The Lord bless thee, bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And keep thee.
Until next time. Hey, I was saving up.